Jarvis Fashions. On the instructions of the parole officer, I telephoned the prison at 1 p.m. from the main post office in town. They said they'd send a prison van in to collect me. While I was waiting, I had to wait about an hour, leaning up against the post office wall in the noonday sun, I caught a glimpse of myself in the display window of the shop across the street, Doris Fashions. I glimpsed a strange man whom I do not know, and whom, when on the odd occasion I have glimpsed her before, I have not warmed to his over-intense visage, hearted, heartful, all that eyes and all that I know. I averted my eyes from the mirror image of Doris Fashions. Yet thinking that it is good that Doris fashions, that there is that much to be salvaged from the wreckage of the moment, that Doris fashions. If you had a daughter called Doris, and after you had spent years rearing her and schooling her and enjoying her and loving her, she left home and set up shop in a country town and called it Doris fashions, how would you feel? You would be proud of her, wouldn't you? <laughs> or if you fell in love with a girl called Doris, and it turned out that she had a little shop of her own called Doris Fashions, you'd be taking a pink. <coughs> All my life I've dreamed of having a motto of my own, my own logo, my own signature chip. Waiting for the prison van to collect me. In the window of Doris Fashions, I see into myself. And I adopt as my own logo, my own signature tune, Doris Fashions. Trying it out to myself on the road out to the prison, Doris Fashions, for the company, for the For who made the word? Doris made the word. And I believe in Doris, and in Doris only. And never, 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 never in John O'Donoghue.
The inevitable call came from the Alzheimer's nursing home. Mummy had been sitting there in an armchair for two years in a top story room with two other aged ladies, Deborah O'Donoghue and Maureen Timoney. The call was to say that between 3 and 5 a.m. that three of them had gone missing from the room. At first it was thought that all three had slipped out the window of a jar at the hot human night. No, there were no torsos in the flower bed. It transpired that a car had also gone missing. It was unthinkable they had commandeered a car. At five in the afternoon, the police called to say that a Polish youth in a car wash in Kinnegad had washed and hot waxed a car for three ladies, all of whom were wearing golden dressing gowns. <laughs> standard issue golden dressing gowns, worn by all the inmates of the Alzheimer's nursing home. Why he remembered them was that he was struck by the fact that all three ladies were laughing for the <coughs> ten minutes it took him to wash the car. I am surprised by laughter. <laughs> At 9 p.m. the car was sighted in town and Barry on the Roscommon side of the River Shannon, parked at the jetty of the Emerald Star Marina. At 9.30 p.m., a female German child was taken to the police station at Longford by her stepfather. The 11-year-old had earlier told her stepfather, in the cabin of their hired Sixburg river cruiser, that she had seen three ladies jump from the bridge. Her stepfather had assumed his stepdaughter imagined it, as she was, he told police, daydreamer born. The girl repeated her story to the police. Um, three small, thin, aged ladies with white hair had all at once together jumped from the bridge, their dressing gowns flying behind them in the breeze. What colours were the dressing gowns? she was asked. They are wearing gold, wreathed on the weird downstream from the bridge. Police sub aquadivers retrieved the three bodies, one of whom, of course, was my own emaciated mother, whose fingerprints were later found on the wheel of the car. She had been driving west, west to Westport, Westport on the west coast of Ireland, in the county of Mayo, where she had grown up with her mother and sisters in the War of Independence and the Civil War. Driving west to Streamstown, three miles outside Westport, where on afternoons in September in 1920, ignoring the roadblocks and the assassinations, they used to walk down Sunnyside by the sea's edge, the curlews and the oyster catchers, the upturned black currucks drying out on the stone and picnic on the macro grass above the seaweed, under the chestnut trees turning autumn gold, and the fuchsia bleeding like troops of crimson tutored ballerinas in the black hedgerows. Standing over my mother's carcass in the morgue, a sheep's skull on a slab, a girl in her birth gown, low across the sand. I shut my eyes. Thank you, O oh Golden Mother, for giving me a life, a spear of rain. After a long life searching for a little boy who lives down the lane, you never found him, but you never gave up. In your afterlife, mighty, you are pure expectantly for the last time.